Hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Ansakwa the Fourth. Indeed, this is one guest that I've been meaning to talk to and share his story with you for quite a bit of time. And today, by the grace of God, it's possible. Folks, he was born in 1919. He's a disciplinarian, he's a medical doctor, he's an educationist, he's a Presbyterian, and he has served for God and country. Indeed, he is a living water that searched for that thirsty land, Ghana, to water it. And indeed, he played his part. I am here to tell the story, have a conversation with Dr. Emmanuel Ivan Zanfo. Amazing that we need such gallant men in Ghana. Folks, we always celebrate people who are tied to politics. But it's about time that we recognize the achievements and the hard work of those who have selflessly contributed to our dear nation. And I'm here to do just that. Leaning here next to his grand piano. When I come back, I'm talking to that doctor. And I know you all know him and you want to hear his story. Don't move. Well, welcome back and thank you for staying. And uh, as I said in the intro, folks, there are some really great and gallant men of this nation who have contributed a great <coughs> deal for Ghana to be a better place for you and I. But somehow we have this habit of only honoring or noticing people if they are sort of tagged to some political coloration. But we need to break out of the cycle and honor heroes regardless. And I'm here to do such, just, just that. Now, Dr. Ivan Zamfo has done a lot and contributed greatly to sports and to the medical, se medical sector. And that's why I'm here. And in fact, as you heard from the uh, intro, you know, he has great links to both my Sinti Misa family and the Opoku family. So I am home. And Doc, thank you very much for welcoming me. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you into my, my home. Thank you. No. Uh, Doc, I'm going to start. Obviously, I got a copy of your book, uh, <coughs> To the Thirsty Land, Autobiography of a Patriot, and indeed, that's exactly what it is. But, Doc, I want to find out, why did you choose the title To uh, the Thirsty Land? Yes, uh, well, I, I went to Achimota College, as it was then. Mm -hmm. And the um, thirsty land, so the thirsty land can be, can be found in one of the lines of the Ashmont School prayer. Uh, you know, the prayer really, and it, and it, it is the, the central mandate which was uh, given to all products of the school, mm -hmm. leaving the school. Mm -hmm. That indeed, you know, they've uh, imbibed, you know, living water why they were in the school. And that water, that living water, needs to go out and water the, the thirsty land wow. of Ghana. Now, although it was really addressed to Achimata's college products, it was it referred in equal measure to products of Infancipin, yeah, Adisa Dell, St. Augustine's, the uh, uh, second cycle schools, mm -hmm. which were then uh, at that time. Okay. And so, so it's, a, it's an, a mandate which was true that time and is even more true now, you know, mm -hmm. that the, the, the land Ghana is a thirsty land and it needs to be watered you know, by the living water of the products of the educational institutions, okay. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have the question of people being trained at the taxpayer's expense and then going to what they call the greener pastures, okay. you know, to lands which have already been quenched, you know, mm -hmm. leaving their own thirsty land needing to be quenched by the living water. Wow, wow, very relevant. Indeed, we need to cleanse the land. But now I'm going to go all the way back to 1925. And bear in mind, Doctor was born in 19, 
19, well before your grandfather was born. <laughs> uh, we've got to go 1925, you know, when you were very excited to start school. And I read the uh, pages and I can almost feel the excitement as you watch your, you know, uh, siblings, you know, walk across the road to school. I remember how you remember it so vividly. It must have made an impression on you. Yes, um, <clears throat> in 1925, you know, I was then six years old. Mm. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I was born in Jamestown, you know, the Evans family house is situated in, in Jamestown, mm -hmm. at the point where the Salagamaka Street joins the Hard Street, High Street, okay. when you're on your way to the lighthouse mm -hmm. and subsequently to Kolibu, okay. you see. And the government school was just across the road from the house. So we took great delight in waiting till, you know, we hear the last bell. And then my siblings and I would just Dash. run across the road <laughs> to school. Dash. School, you know, back then, you know, sometimes maybe living in today, you, you just you, you look all the way back and you wonder, I mean, did you have overcrowded classes like we did, or I mean, were you as naughty as we did, or how was it like? No. Well, in those days, of course, uh, uh, Accra itself was a small, it was really a town, okay. you know, uh, not a city as it is now. And the population was small. Mm. And also, also the school population was small. Okay. But uh, people yearned at that time to send their kids to school, you know. Mm -hmm. And practically every child, you know, uh, also yearned to, to have this sort of experience in school. Mm -hmm. We are attracted by the uniform, you know, <laughs> and the school children marching with the school band and that sort of thing. And this was a great attraction for many. So there was no problem in, in coaxing or coercing children to go to school at all. And the parents were very happy mm. to send their children to school. Now, one thing I noticed is, you know, back then you had to be six or of a certain age to start school. Now, you know, uh, children go to school much, much earlier. I don't know if there's any medical proof to say going to school earlier is better or going to school a little bit later. Wh which is better? <laughs> <laughs> if there is. Well, I think, I think the, the, the age five and six were more or less arbitrary. Mm. Uh, the, 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 there are some children who, who more or less uh, develop early. Mm -hmm. I mean, intellectually, yeah. you know. And they can even go to school at the age of two or three and make it, you know. Mm -hmm. So th that uh, age five or six was more or less really found to be the average and the preferred age mm -hmm. for children, you know, to be able to really take in and imbibe what is happening. But there are many children who were you know, ready more ready intellectually before the age of six than the age of three or four. They can cope with the older children. <clears throat> Let's talk a bit about uh, William and Mary Anfield. They seem to be really dynamic parents. <laughs> how, how, let's, I'll, start, I'll start with that, with uh, William Anfield. He was a cocoa buyer, was he? Yes. Um, well, when I grew up and then knew, knew my father, he was a produce buyer. You know, it was in, in those days when there was a boom in the cocoa industry. Mm -hmm. You know, later, of course, there was the, the depression. But at that time, there was a boom. And well, my father, as I knew him early on, was a, a produce buyer, you know. Cocoa crutch, as they call him. <laughs> and mainly, you know, um, Shuttling between Pakru and Manguasi, mm -hmm. you know, and that sort of thing. Okay, okay. And what, what was Mary doing, your mom? Yes, my mom, you know, um, well, uh, as you probably know, uh, was, was the daughter of a uh, uh, Basel mission catechist, mm -hmm. William Timothy Evans, yeah. you know, who was at the time a tutor at the Basel Mission 
seminary, as it was called. Now it's the Basel Mission, uh, the Presbyterian Training College, and now it met metamorphosed into a university, yeah. part of the campuses, you know. Uh, my mother was born in Akropon, you know, went to school in Akropon, and uh, well, she had just elementary education, yeah. and just she just learned uh, uh, housecraft. Mm -hmm. You know, the Basel missionaries, they were very practical you know, in the education, you know, the approach to education, you know, edu educating the head, heart, and the hand, you know. Yes, so those who were good with their hands, they were encouraged to develop with them. And my mother was one of them. No, and I remember that she used to have, you know, girls come in to her to train them, more or less uh, 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 getting them ready for, for marriage. Mm -hmm. Learn how to cook, how to sew, how to do household chores, and that sort of thing. Her own finishing school then? Yes, <laughs> yes. So that was what my mother was doing. I see, you know. I see. And wh how educated was that? Um, how, how, how educated was your father? My father, you know, uh, uh, went as far as the second cycle school. At, at that time they had so it's like a grammar school. They mm -hmm. call it a grammar school. Mm -hmm. But there were very few, you know, private grammar schools. In our time, those schools had disappeared and the mission, missions had taken over. Okay. You know, uh, in Pansipim, Adisadel, of course, Achimata was a government school, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the Presbyterians at that time were more interested in teacher training, you know, training colleges, rather than secondary school type, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was very late in the day, in the 30s, that they started the, the pre-sec, mm -hmm. as we know it now, yes. as a domasi, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, so my father, you know, he had, he had a second cycle education okay. in one of these uh, old uh, grammar schools. Okay. I, see. I can't give you details. No, of that. no. Too, far, <laughs> too far back. So, Ekropong is where the Evans family obviously met uh, Theophilos, a poku who happens to be my great great grandfather. Yes, yes. As I told you, um, um, my grandfather, he wasn't a, uh, a priest or a pastor, but he was a catechist and was a, was a tutor at the, at the training college, uh -huh. you know. And it's like Cropon. You know, there was a 12 year difference between uh, Theophilus and my grandfather. Wow. But uh, Theophilus was really, he became my grandfather's idol, mm -hmm. really. So, and, uh, so Theophilus took him under the wing, his wing, and they become very good friends. So much so that presently, if you go to Acropon's Basel Mission Cemetery, you'll find them lying side by side. Wow, wow, wow. See, I told, I told the viewers I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> I told the viewers I'm home. Now, uh, Achimota, you loved your time in Achimota. Yes. You know, before I went to Achimota, I'd had uh, what I describe as a uh, very strict Puritan, almost Teutonic Basel mission training mm -hmm. at that famous school, at Osu Salem. Yeah. You know, now uh, Osu Salem Junior Secondary School, Junior High School. Yeah. You know, but this is where the foundation really of my character was laid at Hashimoto. Were they too strict at Osu Salem? Well, it was uh, well, very regimental. Well, we thought, we thought so. <laughs> In fact, some people compared it with our, the army discipline and said, uh, you know, if you could, if you could stand the, the discipline at Osu Salem, then the uh, army, the army discipline would be culture. <laughs> 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 More or less. So they give you a very strict character foundation, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so by the time I got to Achimota, I had this uh, 
foundation already. And of course, Ashimoto was founded on certain principles which really coincided with, with what the Basel mission was doing. But in a more sort of uh, liberal manner, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Ashimoto, I found myself, you know, um, having had this strict character training, you know, I found the atmosphere in Ashimoto, you know, quite liberal, mm. you know, and the opportunity, you know, to really develop. Ashimoto gave you the, the, the opportunities were there, the challenges were there. Mm. Academically, you know, as, as far as sports were concerned, even everywhere, even the use of the hand, the hobbies, and other things, you see. And uh, so I found the years that I spent at Achimota, you know, really very important, formative years of my life. I want to take years. a break here, and then when I come back, we're going to find out how, you know, Doctor was going to pursue a career as a fine artist. And there's just one faithful call. Everything changed. That's why I'm sat here today. Don't move. Well, thank you very much for staying. And uh, we are back. We're still in Achimota. Well, back, back, back in those days, you know. Not the Achimota you know today. But, look, you know, you... you, you uh, wanted to be an artist. Indeed, you were persuaded by the art master, got you a good scholarship, and, uh, you know, something changed. Well, um, you know, I, at a very early age, I, dis I discovered that uh, I had the gift of drawing, hmm. you know, and uh, That, that gift was so great that uh, at Hachimata, the, the art master, you know, thought that as he's got somebody that he could uh, train, really, to become... Mr. Mr. Uh, Mayoritz? Yes. Yeah, Mr. Mayoritz. Uh, Mr. Mayoritz, Mayoritz, you see. And uh, some, some time, uh, some day, you know, succeed him as the uh, art master, you know. Now, well, it's a long story, mm. but uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, in those days, you know, uh, uh, pe pe people in, in the Gold Coast really didn't appreciate artworks and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, very much, you know. I, I wasn't thinking much of that. So then uh, one day, when the, the art master had managed to, you know, work out a scholarship scheme to come for a special training in art after the school certificate examination, you know, I was uh, going, it was a Saturday morning, I was walking to the sports field you know, to watch what was happening. And then uh, my mathematics master, uh, the late Mr. B. A. Brown of, of blessed memory, memory, you know, called me. He had heard about this arrangement, you know, to become an art, art teacher, eventually. And uh, so he um, discussed with me uh, the, the fact that uh, art wasn't really an appreciated thing at that moment in Ghanaian society. And uh, he thought that uh, I, would be re I would be wasted, you know, <laughs> if I went into that profession, yeah. you know. The best I can do is become, to come back and become an art, art master at Achimata College, you know. But he thought that I had better potential, you know, and that I was in the, the position to do any, anything that I wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, he, he pointed out that uh, you know uh, I was always rather on the, on the top or near the top of the class, yeah. you know, and uh, I could do anything I wanted, you know, and there were scholarships for you know professions like medicine, engineering, and other things, and he thought I could think seriously about That's it. this, That's it. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it became a very great problem for me, you know, <laughs> having uh, more or less led the principal and the art master of the garden path, more or less, mm -hmm. uh, accepting this proposal. So I, I went back home and uh, all day I was just lying down thinking and praying, praying about it. And by the way, at that time, I was a member of the Red Cross Society, which went to the, the villages, Anumle, and other villages, you know, ministering, dressing the soils, and things, other things, attending to the sick people. Okay. So, um, I, I felt that I, I had the, you know, the, the, make, the makings of somebody who could really relate uh, well to people who were suffering mm -hmm. and that sort of thing and uh, so why not why not you know like a career have a career, have a career in medicine you know now I've told it at great length in my book you know mm -hmm. I managed that evening to go to the principal yeah you know fortunately for me the principal knew me well because I was one of the prefects of the school. And uh, to cut a long story short, you know, I thought that I was going to get a hostile reception from the principal. That he was very understanding, very understanding, you know. And when I, after I told him all my story, he just uh, said to me, well, Alfon, let me look at your hands. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what the, what the principal was driving at. <laughs> so I look at my hands and I said, well, I suppose you can be a good, a good surgeon. <laughs> a very prophetic remark. Wow. A good surgeon. So I, he told me frankly that uh, he, he supported my change that I had to work things out with the art master, mm -hmm. you know. Was, he, was but, he disappointed? Pardon? Was the art master, was he disappointed? He was. Losing a good student? He was, but uh, uh, God being so good, he too was very understanding. Wow. You know, when I went there the following day, the Sunday, and worked this, this thing out. So this is how, you know, I switched to that to become medicine. Right? My, my problem was that I hadn't, I hadn't really taken the science subject seriously. Look, you know? Now, it's drizzling, so we're going to move from the garden, yes. go and seek some shade and continue this conversation because I don't want it to end now. Stay tuned. shelter we are nice and dry nice tropical rain in the back including <laughs> sunshine so we can't ask for more <laughs> we couldn't ask for more but anyway we're just about finishing uh, that life-changing moment in Achimota where you decide that's it I'm going to pursue yes. medicine so when when you entered tertiary uh, you know, then you knew that look, I'm gonna be a doctor yeah because not many people go to university and try and find out what it's gonna do but that one moment, and let me look at your fingers and decide that you're going to be a good surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> so you went into uh, the tech to pursue medicine. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Well, it wasn't easy entering tertiary. I was going to explain that I, I hadn't offered any serious science subjects 
you know, for the school certificate examination. The sure. only science I've done was general science at the lower level. You know, yes. others were yeah. gone, gone, religious, religious li you know, geography, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, inclined. So I had to uh, do well, uh, six months intensive, you know, uh, revision course of the science subjects. Oh. It wasn't that I, I had no idea of science subjects at all. I had the grounding, you know. All that was left for me was really to build, to get to the level. Mm -hmm. to enter the tertiary sector, okay. you know, and this, I, hadn't, I hadn't worked as hard as I did those six months wow. in order to jump that step, you know, mm -hmm. and God be, be so kind to me, I, I, I managed it. Wow. So, wow. Uh, no, no wonder, that's what Mr. Brown saw, that you were a brilliant student and therefore, you know, give yourself a little more latitude. Yes, I suppose so, yes. But I think Edinburgh always stands out in all your careers and your travels. Edinburgh really stands out for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we want to hear about Edinburgh. Yes. Uh, well, you know, uh, in those days, you know, the, um, and this was war, war time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, um, the war was raging in Europe, and London was a very unsafe place. Mm. You know, Edinburgh, you know, was safer because uh, they have no industries there. Mm -hmm. You know, only uh, educational institutions and whatnot, harmless. You know, mm. you know. So it was not subject to be bombed by the Germans, yeah. and that's it. so Edinburgh was a safe place. And the, most of the uh, government scholars for medicine were sent to Edinburgh. But that was not the only reason, because in those days, the um, colonial medical service in, in, in the Gold Coast was full of Scotsmen. I see. Some graduates of Edinburgh. Oh, okay. You know. But and, and above all, Edinburgh, of course, was uh, one of the top medical schools, you know, not only in the UK, but in the, in the whole world, oh. you know, known for this medicine. So we were very, you know, proud and honored to be sent to Edinburgh. Uh, I think very fascinating is you finding yourself in the Sunday school in Edinburgh, <laughs> teaching, you know, Scottish children about the Bible. Yes. And they must have been abused. Yes. Yes, I must, I must say that uh, I enjoyed that phase of my life, you know. Well, I joined, you know, the, my, my, the church and my area, you know, and uh, I was very happy to, to help with the Sunday school, and the pastor really encouraged me to do that. And the children were really delighted, <laughs> you see. So it, it really gave some, you know, variety to my stay in Edinburgh. I tried to make my stay in the university, life in the university, as useful as possible to myself, so that I can be useful afterwards, you know. So I was engaged in all sort of the sporting and the Christian activities, uh, even, uh, I would say, student politics, <laughs> because I was a, a member of the Student Representative Council in my second year, okay. you know. Yes. The, uh, there's only probably now just over 60 years ago, uh, but it was still amazing that there were still people who found it surprising that you could speak English. <laughs> Did I speak English? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yes. That's right. You, 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 you know. Uh, and you know, in those days, there was a lot of ignorance hmm. about. Uh, the, the British Empire by the British population, mm -hmm. you know. Many of them, they don't even know where uh, Accra is. The only place they've heard of is Nairobi because it's packed with the Europeans, mm -hmm. you see, mm -hmm. or Freetown because it was a staging post, you know, during the war for the ships going up and down. But uh, nothing else, and they knew even less 
about people you know, coming from these places, you see. I mean, so well, you had passports to say you were a British subject. Yeah, yeah. At that time, we were all British subjects, not British citizens, but British subjects, you see. And so uh, one found that, uh, you know, some the ignorance sometimes leads to um, uh, prejudice, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, on the other hand, uh, when they find that, uh, for example, you meet a Scotsman and who finds that you speak better English than he does, <laughs> you see, and he wonders, but then quite a number of them will respect you for that. Others will not like to see you, mm -hmm. you know, a black man. You know, but on the whole, I found that uh, the average Britisher, you know, really had mad merit. Okay. If you're a good sportsman, if you're a good academician, if you're good uh, in, in other fields, they respect you. I see. You know, I see. and not, never mind your color, mm -hmm. you see. And that, that has grown gradually. Now, of course, I remember the time, you know, in those days, going to London and walking along Oxford Street, that the Oxford Street in London, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which is miles long. Yeah. You can walk, you know, along the whole length of Oxford Street and meet just about a dozen colored people, wow. uh, well, black people mm -hmm. from West Africa or from the West Indies. And that's about. Now, when you go to London, every, every you other probably person. need more, <laughs> more, you see. So yeah. there's been these changes. Mm -hmm. So in our time, you know, the British society was still at a, well, I would call it a learning stage, mm -hmm. you know learning to know where the empire is. Uh, fortunately, it didn't take long till after the war for that empire to start crumbling. It's disintegrating. You know. Also in Edinburgh, you met one lovely lady that we cannot do this interview without talking about, Leonora. <laughs> <laughs> How did it all happen? Well, Leonora, uh, of course, it wasn't wasn't uh, from Africa. No. Well, she had African roots. Okay. But she was a citizen of the United States. You know, I met her, and she came to do Edinburgh University to do a general arts course. I met her when I had already qualified as a doctor, and finishing my internship in in uh, the north of England, in Yorkshire, okay. and going to Edinburgh to register, you know, to take the courses leading to specialization in surgery. Mm -hmm. And this is where, where we met, right. you know. And uh, well, right from the beginning, uh, it was quite clear that uh, we were made for each other. So when, even when you came to Ghana, uh, you went to Dunkwa, when she, made, she came for her first visit, it must have been exciting. <laughs> yes, uh, and then when I left after my studies, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we hadn't even taken the final decision that we would get married. Okay. You know, we hadn't. Uh, but one thing she said was that, you know, whatever it is, before she finished her studies, after she finished her studies, she'll come and visit the Gold Coast before going home. That was a promise she made, okay. you see. And I came back home. I was posted to Dunkwa. I was still a bachelor mm -hmm. at the time. Posted to Dunkwa in 1951. And that same year, you know, she was, she had another year to finish uh, a course at the university. So the, the last summer vacation, she came on what she called the educational tour, <laughs> you know, six months tour. Where, the, and it was after that visit that we really, you know, decided 
because she liked what she saw. Mm -hmm. My people liked her, and everything was okay. Isn't that a beautiful story? Isn't that a beautiful story? But when, when you came back from Edinburgh, then, I think your first person was Kolebu, right? Yes, yeah. I was in Kolebu for nine months. Nine months. Was there a major difference back then in uh, the medical care you get north of London, like in Yorkshire, and that of Kolebu, or it was similar then? Because today we hear a lot of complaints that, oh, we come back and we don't have gloves, we don't have this, we don't have that. In, the, in that time, did you have the same complaints or was it better? Well, it was worse. In our time, we really had to improvise, wow. you know. You had to forget that you are... <laughs> Uh, you have to forget about what you enjoyed, you know, the facilities. No, I'm, going so to, I'm going to take a break here because I want to hear more of that because I was under the illusion that, well, back then, there may have been lots and lots of things. Apparently, they had the same problem. They're coming straight back. Well, thank you uh, very much for staying, and I am talking to... Dr. Emmanuel Evans and Foreman. My God, this is all he's done. I only have an hour. I'll do my best. <laughs> but we're just looking at uh, the services uh, at Kolibu back then when you came back from. Uh, where were you? Were you in Leeds or? No, in I was. Yorkshire? Well, yeah, with, I was in, in uh, a place called Dewsbury, Dewsbury, eight miles south of Leeds. Okay. Yes. Okay, and Dewsbury. So I'm just trying to look at the uh, services and the conditions that they would give the doctor back then in Dewsbury, and then you come to Kolebu. I was thinking that well, back then it would have been, you wouldn't even notice that you left Dewsbury, but no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had, we had problems in the medical practice, you know. First of all, uh, we were very few, okay. you know, Gold Coast doctors, very few Gold Coast doctors. You know, most of the doctors in the public service were expatriates, mm -hmm. you see. And Kolebu, when I joined Kolebu uh, in 1950, you know, they, uh, there were about 13 doctors. And there were just two Gokul's doctors, myself and the late uh, Dr. Bannerman, who had a practice at uh, Teshinongwa Estate. Mm -hmm. There were two of us. So it was, uh, although, Kolebu was a smaller place. I think they, they had a, the bed was about 200. Okay. A smaller place, you know. Yeah, there was more for us to do because we had to be on call alternate days, you see. And, uh, and then there was a the question of, uh, I got the impression that uh, people, quite a number of people came to Kolebu to, just to die. After they've tried all sorts of places in the last and they came there in order to, to, to get to, uh, to a death certificate in the event of their death, you see. Wow. They came there in extremists and it was, hope they, it was nothing you could do. You know what to do, but uh, you couldn't do anything. And thirdly, there were certain aspects of the, for example, there was no blood bank. Wow. And there were cultural, you know, reasons why we couldn't get blood. I had come from a place where if you wanted blood, the doctor wanted the blood, you can sign just like a check, and then they bring the blood. And here, you, your patient is dying, losing blood, and, uh, and people are reluctant to give blood, you know, wow. and that sort of thing. And of course, well, the supply situation in a way, you know, wasn't bad. If you were prescribed, you had a prescription, you know, you knew you'll get most of it in the hospital, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, before the, you know, outside the pharmaceutical, you know, uh, market grew, you see, mm -hmm. you got your thing in the hospital. So there were these small, small uh, problems that we had. Doctor, you've also been <clears throat> the vice chancellor for the University of Science and Technology, uh, commissioner for education and culture. Uh, uh, you've been a member of the Council of State. Uh, you've been a chairman of Ghana Hockey Association, uh, chairman of National Education Commission, president Ghana Medical Association, president West African College of Surgeons, 
chairman, Center for Scientific Research, may you have saved this nation. But I'm going to go to you being a vice chancellor because here were you, you know, really, if I may say, hardcore practicing doctor. And then you get a call one morning to say, go and head the USD. Yes. I mean, how, how did you take it? <laughs> You're going to put down your stethoscopes? And yes. <clears throat> well, no, no, this, this was, uh, uh, at that time, I had, I had been a doctor for 20 years. Mm. And I had been a foundation staff of the medical school. And I've been there just for three, for three years. We were just building something new, you know. And then this call comes for me to go to, to uh, Kumasi to become vice chancellor. And I tell you, you know, I had, it was 24 hours of agony for me. Wow. Really thinking, you know, whether it was a wise thing. It wasn't offered to me on a silver platter. You asked, just me, would you like your name to go forward for consideration? Yes, sir. So there was no guarantee that, I, you know, so I said, well, in any case, I won't be, I won't be selected. So why should I bother? <laughs> You see, but then in the end, you know, I thought, you know, and I still think that education, education, education really is something which we need in this country. I've done 20 years for health, and of course, it doesn't mean that I've ceased to be a doctor. Once a doctor, you're always, always a doctor. You can give your medical opinion, all sorts of ways in which you can help. Yeah, but this is an opportunity ready to really take part in education. So in the end, you know, uh, I was called to go. And as you know, as, as you can think, there was resist resistance, protests, you know. The loudest came from my patients, you see. And then my, some of my colleagues at the, the school, us. you see, the switching from, and then of course generally people think, well, how can a doctor be a vice chancellor? And then uh, when I became vice chancellor, I said to myself, well, there's no school for vice chancellors. Kwapon is a classicist, Burton is a geographer, so many things. You can come from any background. But it isn't, it isn't enough, not the academic or professional thing, but there are other qualities that people are looking for. And this is where, you know, I refer to my upbringing. The Osusalem, <laughs> Achimotan School, the values we were taught, yeah. and that sort of thing, you know. And values which are sadly lacking in our society today, you know. I've been taught, you know, a, a, a leadership by example, you know. <clears throat> If you are corrupt, you know, people will be corrupt. If you find you upright and that uh, you are willing to take uh, action against corruption, you will find that you will be can achieve much. And that's the reason why I took, I took, you know, the offer of, of appointment as vice chancellor, and I, I will never regret it because it really. When you are a doctor and a surgeon, you, you, you have a, a tunnel vision, narrow vision. As vice chancellor, you know, you see the problem, the wider development problems in the country, you know, the wider, you know. And I've gained that much, much personally, you know. And I hope I've been able to, to, to give something in return, you know. Uh, Wherever I go in the, in the country, just, I meet people who have been my patients, my students, uh, and my colleagues at the uh, UST. And uh, I feel, you know, satisfied. That, you know. What, one thing I want to say is our generation, our generation where we were willing and ready to come and help. They felt they were living water to come and help, you know. 
you see, mm -hmm. our generation. And we've done that. But then we have the new generation, which, uh, you know, they live in, they, 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 they live in what I'm going to, uh, you know, <laughs> the green pastures. And we are losing a lot. The, the, the potential is there. The potential is there. If only we can, you know, if we, only we can really get people well educated right through, you know. So they know when they are voting, they understand why they are voting and why they should vote. And why they should vote to the right person, you know. Not because they've been given, you know, a few cities during the election. And politicians come, you know, with their sweet tongues. You know, you know. Doc, let me go to some sad moments uh, in your life. Uh, <coughs> 3rd of May, 1980, you lose Leonora, your lovely wife. And ironically, same place where you first met in Edinburgh. Yes. Uh, that might shake you to your foundations. Yes. Uh -huh. Well. <coughs> I don't think I can complain. I can't complain because uh, I felt at that time that she's done her duty. I never really thought that I would be living so many years after, you know. But then, when God closes one door, He opens another. Yeah. And that's why I survived. Because I've got a loyal companion yeah. all these years. Elsie. I want to talk about Elsie. What? I said, I want to talk about Elsie. Yeah. Elsie uh, Henke, she was then. Mm -hmm. Elsie. You met... Uh, Elise. 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 Yes. Yeah. And she's been a wonderful companion. Yes. I think the Lord has blessed you with a, you know, another companion yes. to keep you happy. How are things with you and Elise? No, I think we get on. We get on well, you know. Uh, the partnership is not the same. We are not going around the country now, not building up the thing, you know. It's uh, just maintenance work and uh, more or less uh, even the benefit of what we know, both of us, you know. To the younger people, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Now, you are a stound uh, Presbyterian, which of course I am, and I was, one of your pictures here of when I think you were being uh, sworn in as a chancellor sat next to you. There was my grandfather, <laughs> the very right Reverend G.K. Sinti Misa. Look at that. Oh, ah! <laughs> yeah. Uh, very stout, and you've contributed a great deal. Uh, especially to the Usu Presby. Yes. I mean, are you able to be active now? Or? Well, I'm still, I'm still a member. I've been a member. I was confirmed in that congregation uh, in June 1934. And I've retained my membership since then. Wow. And I go to church when I'm able, you know, and uh, people visit me. I've been a senior presbyter for some time, you know. When I'm active, I give whatever support I can to the church, you know, because the Presbyterian Church, in my view, still, you know, uh, really wields uh, a good influence in the field of discipline, you know. There was an, a, a period, you know, when you uh, uh, apply for a job in the civil service, you know, and among your CVs they find that you've been to Osu Salem, you know. It was a plus. You have no problem at all. Wow. All because, uh, you know, they know you'll be a discipline.
discipline does. So I continue to help my church. And they, they continue, they recognize me, they visit me, you know, and it's been kept, it's kept me going. No, let's go, just to be a sports. Where did your love for hockey come from? <laughs> Well, when I went to Achimata, mm. I, had, I, I hadn't even never seen a hockey stick, <laughs> you see. And I've devoted a few pages there to how I became a hockey player. My friend, one of the greatest hockey players I think this country has produced, Kofi Mesa Atiemo, who mm. was my classmate. And he was the one who really coached me, taught me how to handle the hockey stick. And I discovered quite early that I could use the stick quite effectively, you see. So that uh, before I left, for two years, I played for the, for the college. Okay. When I got to Edinburgh, immediately they grabbed me to the university uh, team, which I captained for two years, wow. you see. Combined Scottish universities, you know, when I came back in 1950, mm -hmm. Together with other colleagues, Atiemu, the late K. Konoa, and others, we founded the Gold Coast Hockey Association. You know. I'm just going to skip to one incident in the book, and I'll, and I'll read it. It says, I think what really impressed me was the indication of the confidence that Otunfo had in us. I went to the hospital to have a chat with him. By this time, he was feeling a bit better. As soon as I... Uh, entered the ward, he said to me, Dr. Alfu, haven't, uh, haven't you been dealing with cases like this? Is it the first time uh, you people are seeing? No, sir. Uh, we deal with patients with these conditions regularly. So why are you advising me to go abroad? And he says, by this time, I felt a bit foolish to that question. And I said, yeah, no, no, we can do it here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, <clears throat> well, the story is told in my book, but you know, we, we, no, no, a two for us, the Sergei Mampenpe showed great confidence in us. My boss, Dr. Boss, 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 Bo, uh, Bozeman, who had retired at that time, and my, and my, my senior colleague, uh, Dr. Ismond, mm -hmm. later Professor, Professor Ismond, mm -hmm. you know, in a, a matter like that, you know, you had to consult, you know. So the three of us together decided that, you know, for political reasons and all sorts of, you know, he should be sent abroad, you know. But Nana said, no. You treat other people, you know, who have got this condition, perhaps more, even more serious. And why can't you treat me, mm -hmm. you know? So really, we bowed to his wishes, and uh, God being so kind, everything went off well, you know. And I thought, really, it was a very good example that Nana uh, Otumfo gave mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And it really encouraged us, you know, to go on and do more, even more. Leadership by example again. Yes, yes. Dr. Alfum, I wish I had more time to talk because I have not even done half of the book yet, but unfortunately that's all time will allow us. But I promised you that I was going to bring you one gallant Ghanaian, somebody who's really contributed a great deal to this nation in terms of education, sports and medicine, Dr. Emmanuel Ivanzamfu. Folks, until next Friday that I come to you with a, a new personality, have a beautiful, beautiful weekend. Doctor, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much indeed.